up to it, how it came about. And I think what's perhaps not recognized enough is the kind of legacy of that protest. It really encapsulates the energy of the movement and the real international nature of it. And I remember watching it in the cinema when it came out and I went alone and I actually cried at one point and people were clapping at the end and it was just amazing, amazing energy and amazing memories. Um, and it's still such a great reminder of what our movement is capable of and how important it is that we do resist and we keep the anti-war movement alive. So I'm really pleased tonight that we're joined for discussion about the We Are Many film by the film's director, Amir Amrani, as well as writer and activist and one of the organizers of that two million strong march in London, John Rees, as well as another key anti-war activist who's played an important role in the activities of Stop the War, Salma Yacoub. So welcome all three of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm it's going to be a great discussion and I look forward to keeping an eye, as I said, on the questions as they come in um, and putting some of those to our panellists. So please do post in the chat box on the right if you're watching us on Zoom um, or in the comments on Facebook if you're tuning in via Facebook Live. Um, I'm going to first go to the director of the film, Amir, and ask you, Amir, tell us about how you kind of came up with the idea of the film, because you've worked on a lot, of, a lot of other projects that are not really similar to this kind of thing. And um, so what gave you the idea to do it? And talk us through the process of putting it all together. Sure. So <clears throat> in 2003, I actually happened to be in, in February in Berlin at the Berlin uh, Film Festival, taking part with a, with a short film. and and I knew that the protest was going to happen. And then the question arose, should I stay in Berlin uh, and take part or come back to London? On a whim, I decided to, to take part in Berlin, which was huge, you know, half a million people, you know, cold and very exciting. I came back to London and what was immediately noticeable was that um, my friends and lots of people I knew were sort of saying, my God, you missed an amazing day. And I said, well, you know, it was pretty big in Berlin. And they said, no, no, you have no idea. It was huge here and as if it was something historic which of course it turned out to be and so I started thinking you know I really missed out um, that was the first clue that there was something interesting here to to excavate and it sort of stayed with me and over the next couple of years I kept coming back to it and thinking about it um, and one day I thought well let let me find out you know where else this ha happened and as I dug into it, I realized it was, it was global. And then one day I had a real light bulb moment and I thought, well, hang on, it seems like it was in hundreds of cities. This was a historic you know, event. I want to know how this happened and isn't that an amazing story? Um, and so I started looking into it initially just as a way of you know, documenting it. And then I realized actually that it needed to be told because for, for posterity, I think there needed to be a film record of something you know, like this. Um, I didn't know when I started that it was going to take me ultimately nine years um, to make it. So I started researching it and piecing the story together, meeting people. So obviously I met with the Stop the War Coalition. Uh, we have two of the great members here and then piecing it together and going around and meeting other people. And when I felt finally that I had the pieces together, I started to fundraise. So that research took me four years. Um, nobody would fund it, even though I had, you know, made documentaries for the BBC and Channel 4. And so I started to, you know, uh, look for other sources. No institutions anywhere in the world would fund it. No Sundance, no BFI, nowhere. And Kickstarter came along. So I raised my initial money on Kickstarter. And that small amount got me going. And I had no idea where the rest would come from. But it came ultimately from um, donations from private uh, backers and so I set about going around the world I filmed in seven countries around the world I interviewed 110 people of which about half actually make it into the film um, and you know got it ultimately done and it was out in cinemas in 2015 so it was a nine-year journey um, and we can talk a little bit later about why that actually turned out to be quite useful um, because of the way the story ended and what I could put into the film. Um, and also in a way fitting because the protest, whilst it didn't stop the war, did have a long lasting impact. And that's something I'm looking forward to, to, to discussing. And that, that could only in a way have been captured because it took quite a while uh, to make. 
so really the motivation for me was uh, initially just as a filmmaker how amazing that such a thing happened and how did it happen um and then as i was making it thinking i have to tell this story because i don't think anybody else in the broadcasting world would tell it and it needed someone to record it for posterity so that's thank you Mayor. Thank you. Next, I'm going to go to one of the founders of the Stop the War Coalition, who is involved in the demonstration in London, John Rees. John, there's a point in the film where you kind of laugh about the initial idea to make this a day of international protest. What was it like, the kind of practicalities of organising the demonstration, and how did it feel to actually see that pulled off? Well, th there was quite a long uh, prehistory to the demonstration. There were a number of, uh, of actually, by the standards of the, of the day then, uh, large uh, demonstrations in London against uh, uh, against the the, the Afghan uh, in, invasion uh, before we got to Iraq. Um, so so the movement was actually quite big in, in this country and elsewhere even before we got to the question of the demonstration on on February the fifteenth. And then there was um, an actual organised. Um, uh, process. Uh, one moment in that was definitely the 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 meeting of the social forum in uh, in Florence. Uh, there was there was actually a physical meeting that we all went to where we um, debated uh, which day uh, we should uh, we should choose. Um, I think some of the people there wanted to go earlier. Some wanted to go later. We eventually set, settled on February the. The 15th. So there was an infrastructure coming out of the, the pre-existing anti-capitalist uh, movement, an international infrastructure uh, and an actual decision making process, however chaotic, which came up with that. And that that in itself was a was a tremendously kind of galvanizing experience uh, to go through. I, I've never been to a meeting where we we discussed an international demonstration and came out with a decision. I mean, that was pretty uh, unique experience for a start off. Then, and to this day, um, there will be people in um, the, uh, the radical movement in Egypt who will tell you that this was born out of a decision at the Cairo conference. Um, that, <laughs> I'm, I'm always sorry to correct them, but that I wish it were true, it isn't true. But what is true is that the decision of the Cairo conference um, to participate in that, took this out of the sort of uh, northern hemisphere and put it into the the, the arena of the of the Middle East and cru crucially into uh, into Egyptian uh, Egyptian society. So those were two international conferences which were very important staging posts to uh, to February the uh, February the fifteenth. And um, you know I always say this about the movement: we, we didn't create the anti-war mood. Uh, uh, we didn't create uh, the, the feeling in, in millions of people that they didn't like the war, uh, but we did give it a political expression and we did give it an organised form and it wouldn't have been as powerful a movement, it wouldn't have been what it became, it wouldn't have been as politically effective if that hadn't have been done by you know, thousands of activists, tens of thousands of activists, just in this country and, and many tens of thousands beyond the shores. Thanks, John. I'm now going to go to one of the patrons of and an activist within Stop the War, uh, who again plays a starring film, a starring role in the film, Salma Yacoub. Salma, thanks for being here tonight. You've been involved in Stop the War since its inception and travelled all over the country for meetings and events organising against war and interventions. What do you see as a legacy of that, that kind of one demonstration and, and why is it so important that the work of Stop the War continues? Well, first of all, I just want to pay tribute to Amir. Um, this has been a labour of love. I remember when we began the interviews and how long it took for the film to be completed. And I'm so, so glad that he took it on. Um, it's a reflection of the politics that exists, that he had to do it in this way, and the fact that the so-called mainstream media haven't um, really reflected what happened in the way this film has. I'd recommend everybody to watch it. It's actually really inspiring. And many people are probably feeling demoralized right now, looking at what's happening in the world, not just with the virus, but 
you know, the broader political kind of shifts that, are, that have been happening. But when you watch the film, it's not just about the day itself, it's the run up to it. So how the mainstream media were kind of projecting what was going on, how ordinary people were questioning, they were being told, no, you're wrong by you know, all the sensible people, the so-called sensible people. And it wasn't easy at the beginning to just say, look, this isn't right. You know, it was a real act of courage and it took a lot of persistence because power doesn't just turn around and say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you're right. You know, it took a lot of um, galvanizing, all the people coming together. And the film really captured that. And an interesting part of it is seeing those same people, some of them who have actually now admitted that they got it so, so wrong. And acknowledging that ordinary people who were so dismissed, they were sneered at, they were called all sorts of names, you know, traitors, um, you know, immature, you know, let the grown ups do the thinking. Yeah, you know, all the kind of things we're still hearing, you know, when it comes to people just asking for the basics, you know, we don't want war, we don't want privatization, you know, when it comes to the bigger issues around the economy as well as war. And that's why I think this film really stands, not just in terms of. A, a fantastic um, embodiment of the anti-war movement, but, but the power of doing the right thing, um, just because it is the right thing. Nobody at the beginning knew that it would end up being the British, but being the biggest march in human history. That's what happened. And there's been all sorts of fallouts, I would say, in terms of positive legacy as a result. But I would really urge everyone to watch the film, get their friends to watch it. Although it's it's terrible that we're still seeing the negatives of the Iraq war to this day. This film actually is a real antidote as well because it captures the real positive human spirit and the importance of just standing up and doing the right thing um, and why that's important of itself as well as you know all the kind of bigger political analysis. So I just want to really pay tribute to uh, Arm because I know it can't have been an easy personal experience um, for him as well. Um, and in terms of myself, you know, um, I was, yes, a young mom then. By the time the film came out, you know, the kids I had in push chairs at the demo, you know, were teenagers and just the experience of watching it because, you know, there's a lot of sacrifice involved for people on an individual level. Um, you know, it's not like people have got no income that they have to worry about, families to raise. If people kind of talk about the demos as, a, you know, it's just this thing that happens. No, it takes people taking out time and energy from other things that they're doing and often at a price. But when I watched that film with my kids, I remember feeling a real sense of pride and you know, everything has been worth it. Um, and it's good to be reminded of that because um, like I said, the kind of mainstream art going to do that for us. And in fact, I think it's the power that they always want to make us feel powerless. And that's what they're good at. And we have to kind of remind ourselves constantly and this film I think was a really really important really important um, kind of message and reminder for us not just about what's happened in the past but giving us the strength to do what we need to right now. Mm. I think that's absolutely right it's a reminder of how powerful we actually are and also so I just want to say that you are still a young mum. <laughs> um, I've got a few Sorry? Uh, no, I'm 50. I'm heading for 50 next year. And, you know, my boys yeah. are all grown up. So it's, yes, it literally has been a lifetime you know, doing this stuff. But now seeing the next generation, what's happening around climate change, the confidence. Um, I think there is a lot that what happened around the Arab Spring. And I'm sure that John um, will we, we'll be able to you know, go into more detail about that. There has been um, that kind of rising up. But again, it's about staying true to um, our values, our principles, and not losing heart just because you don't win the initial kind of battle. There is always a bigger war going on in terms of um, the clash between those who have and those who don't have, those who want to hold it, those who want to monopolize power, you know, and are happy to exploit others whilst doing so. And for me, those lessons are, are as relevant now as they were then. Absolutely. I think that's a good point as well in terms of the legacy, you know, these movements that we see today, uh, the climate strike and things like that. It's all kind of, I think it's part of that, that legacy of that day. I've got a few questions that have come in and people please um, 
please keep them coming in in the chat box um, or if you're watching the, the YouTube live stream, I'm keeping my eye out for what's coming through. I'm going to ask a few at a time and then I'm going to come to you guys in succession if that's okay. So I've got a question here from Ayad and he asks, what peaceful actions can we as individuals or as groups do to have Tony Blair brought to justice? And then my second question comes from Stuart Blair, who I assume is no relation. And Stuart asks, what is the main lesson the filmmakers took from the process regarding democracy and how it operates? Are we doomed to repeat the past? And finally, a question from Yowri. Why was the anti-war movement able to galvanize so many across the globe to protest the upcoming invasion of Iraq in the hopes to stop it? But it seems that same global effort and the same numbers weren't able to be recreated when it comes to successive wars. And Yari mentioned specifically, specifically Libya, Syria and Yemen, for example. Um, and my follow up question to that really is, do you think it is something we will see again on such a scale? And John, I'm going to go to you first. Yeah, yeah, I'd specifically like to, to deal with that because that question comes up so frequently. Um, and I think how we answer it um, teaches us not just about what has actually happened, but about how you should judge these things uh, politically. Now, I, I, under, I quite understand, actually, that many, many people um, who were on that demonstration for the first time, who'd never seen anything like it, none of us had, um, thought that its immediate effect would be um, to kind of stop the war there and then. Now, I never thought that, although I have to say since, um, I have come to understand that we came much closer than perhaps we thought. When you look at um, the memoirs, Tony Blair's memoirs, Alistair Campbell's memoirs, and so forth that have come out afterwards, it's clear that there was a point where the Americans said to the British government, you don't have to be in on this. You don't have to come. We understand there is such domestic opposition. It's very difficult for you. Opt out if you like. And uh, the one thing I'll say about Tony Blair is, he is personally culpable because at that point he said, no, I'm coming anyway, and he needn't have done. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to see him in The Hague uh, anytime soon, but he deserves to, to, to be there. Um, what I do want to say, though, is about the, the effect of it um, on the conduct of warfare uh, since the Iraq war. And it's true there have been other wars, but not like Iraq. You see, Iraq was an absolutely huge uh, shock and awe, land invasion and occupation of another country. Now, they've never done that since. What they've done since is bombing, drones, targeted assassinations, and I'm not minimizing for a moment the destruction, the death that's involved in that, but it's in a different register to the kind of invasion that Iraq was. So although we didn't stop that war, I would say that we have inhibited, and this is quite a thing, we have inhibited the major military powers on the globe from conducting that kind of warfare, which is the most destructive and deadly kind of warfare. We haven't stopped warfare, we haven't stopped the drone attacks, we haven't stopped the air wars, but we have stopped that for the time being. And that really, when you're talking about a situation where you're constantly in conflict with very powerful governments, that about, that's about as good as it gets, short of actually stopping it. So I think that was a very significant effect. I mean, there are others that the, the, that Tamir talks about in the film with Egypt and so forth and so on, other effects in this country politically, quite important effects. But, but if I had to put my finger on one, I would say inhibiting them for nearly 20 years now from conducting that kind of bloodshed, that's quite a political achievement. Thanks, John. Now, Amir, one of those questions is particularly for you, really, around the, the main takeaways and the lessons that you took from the process, and it, it specifically asks about democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a big, um, big question because, you know, a lot of people who had never demonstrated came out you know, on that day. And um, I think there was a, there was a, those, you know, millions of people had a faith in democracy that actually if that many people demonstrate, it would have some meaning, it would give them 
cause for thought. And the fact that it went ahead and we now know that it was planned you know, very long in advance, um, it sort of you know, lifted the veil from lots of people's eyes, or you could, you could describe it as people losing um, faith in democracy. I mean, interestingly, um, we, on our website, uh, we invited stories of people from people about the day and so many of them talk about saying how they came to in this case in the UK to London on that day you know hearts sort of pounding with hope um, and then when they went back and saw that the media coverage wasn't wasn't um, great but that actually the war went ahead they totally lost faith in politics I mean it was a moment of fissure in in British politics and you know lots of people um, cite that day as the most visible sort of crack in people's faith in politics and and therefore you could argue the direct damage to the to our to our democracy you know that, that put a, a big nail you know in the coffin um, so it, it, it you know, lots of young people then from that point said, well, you know, electoral politics and this kind of politics is maybe not for us. And they went into various other kind of protest movements and, you know, um, talking about maybe civil disobedience and, and others. Lots and lots of people obviously deserted the Labour Party because of that. And lots of people maybe didn't come back until maybe Jeremy came uh, into the leadership. So you can, you can trace the damage to our democratic uh, belief system um a lot of it to to that day i mean i'm sure there are many many other factors but i think it was a very visible demonstration to a lot of people that millions can gather and it it has apparently no impact on the um on the leaders and we've been dealing with that damage ever since i think mm -hmm. Thanks, Amir. And Salma, do you have any thoughts in terms of how we bring Tony Blair to justice or thoughts about, you know, will we see something like that on such a scale and in particular around successive wars, wars that may not have happened yet? Well, I think if it had a, a Jeremy Corbyn led government, we might have inched a bit closer to um, a Hague scenario for Tony Blair. And I don't think for a second that um, part of the undermining of Jeremy Corbyn a lot of it was tied up with the fact he refused to kowtow to the pro-war agenda. And they feared that somebody might actually have their hands on the wheels of power who wasn't going to be part of that club and who may even bring some accountability into it. Um, so as Tony Blair as an individual, yes, um, I hope and pray that his day of reckoning will come, but I think right now the the bigger issue is how democracy was exposed as not being so democratic after all, the, the disillusionment that followed. The positives of that were that people organized in different ways because they knew they couldn't just rely on one particular route. The downside, I think, was that that feeling of disempowerment, which after all is what those in power want the majority to feel, did take hold as well. So I think one of the reasons that you know, one of the questions that came up is how come so many people never mobilized after that? I think some of that hope that a direct consequence of people coming out and protesting would happen because that that was lost in many ways. That did, I think, reduce um, the kind of motivation of people coming out. It didn't mean that people were suddenly more pro-war. It wasn't that they felt that the argument had been lost, but the the feeling of we can do something about it, I think it, it, it's fairly accurate to say that, that that really was not that confidence. And that's why I think watching this film is so important because it's easy to kind of go through that and get stuck at that place. But when you watch this film and you watch again how it all happened, the kind of run up, the kind of arguments that were used, the kind of the media game, the political game, but also what ordinary people, how when they express what their actual instincts around it were, which on the whole are, we don't want you know, some people to get hurt. And the fact that that's an international thing, the fact the majority of people do feel it and why it's important that we don't allow these divisions to, to come um, in the way. 
that for me is still, you know, it, it, it's such an important thing to to hold on to. Um, so I keep coming back to the fact that please do watch it. Um, and I certainly, you know, I watch, I, I kind of myself, you know, say, you know, to my kids, right, we're going to watch this, you know, to give ourselves a boost, you know, because it's, you know, you kind of get demoralised, which is easy to do when you see, when you see the, the things we're up against. But at the same time, again, this battle between the powerful and those who they seek to keep under their power is never going to be over in one day, no matter what. I think it's a kind of an ongoing long-term issue and they've now found other ways. So for example, what we're seeing with the elections, what we're seeing with dark money, what we're seeing with the whole targeting you know, of Facebook, using people's psychological profiles um, in such a sophisticated, but actually very, very sinister way. So now it's not just about how, it's about how they've captured the democratic levers to, so although the mask has come off in some ways, now they've kind of reasserted themselves in other ways. So, it's for us to keep alive to that and still always question and say, look, actually, this is about us. And I think that what the coronavirus has done is kind of rebalance some perceptions about actually who is important and what does make the world go around. And you can't just keep taking those people granted and you can't keep taking away the kind of safety nets because ultimately it's going to affect everybody. And I think the interesting thing about this virus is that the rich are being affected and they're not insulated, their money, the lies, the power structures are set up, the kind of gatekeeping that's gone on has not been a protection for them. And actually when it comes down to it, they're reliant on the cleaners, on the public uh, sector workers to keep them and their families safe. Whereas before you could privatize, you could you know, buy a better class of insurance, you could protect yourselves from the kind of things other people being exposed to. And I hope that in all of this, because what the right is really normally very good at is capitalising on the crisis that they, they created. And we saw this after the financial crisis. Again, you know, it was an opportunity or a situation where people should have recalibrated on a bigger level, but the right quickly took that ground. I think right now as the left uh, and people who cared about, you know, the anti-war stance, for me, it's about, you know, putting that same energy and passion into what's going on economically, what's going on in our health care, what's going on in our food kind of chains, or what's going on with the climate crisis. All of these things are linked. So if you look at those people who to this day, you know, champion a pro-war kind of militaristic agenda, are the very people who are the people responsible for making our kind of food supply insecure, for making our health care, you know, becomes a commodity which, you know, when it should be a, a right. So I think fighting those battles you know maybe in this renewed form are just as important now and now we also are more connected so the things which took us longer to organize you know now that we have you know for now the fact that we're having this kind of meeting you know we can organize internationally and i hope that you know we we kind of take be proactive i think that it was about people being proactive at that point not saying well look this is really sad and we can't do anything about it so you know thinking and acting that in the way that, yeah, it's really bad, and we're not the ones who made those decisions, but we're going to definitely bring those people to account and also make ourselves count and say, look, not in my name. You might think that's not a strong thing to do, but those people in Egypt who were inspired were saying, it's because we saw people caring and saying not in our name in England, we knew that we're not alone. And just the power of not feeling isolated is, is so, so important. Um, so for me, all these things are linked, they're relevant. And I think for me, it's about us as the left, you know, I count myself in that, is kind of being proactive right now, not waiting for the kind of right to take narrative and all the issues. So this is where we should be calling for universal basic income. This is where we should be saying that we demand those wage increases. This is where we say, no, we're not gonna have more austerity imposed upon us because the right will say, well, we spent all this money, you know, getting through the crisis. Um, the taps are turned on, but now they have to be turned off and even more so, because that's the kind of thing that they're going to gear up to. And we have to be ready for that. We can't be complacent and assume that because things have you know, been so upturned that it's going to somehow fall, you know, the, the piece is going to fall in the right way because there's nothing inevitable about that. Thanks, Salma. I think you're absolutely right about this film being something that can give people a boost and to stop them feeling isolated. And I actually think even just this discussion is making me feel 
less isolated alone in my living room tonight. Guys, please keep the questions coming. We've had a few more, which is fantastic. And I'd be really interested to know as well if we've got people um, tuning in from um, different countries. You know, we, it is an international movement. Um, I've got some food for thought here from Candy, who said it's so difficult to get ethical government anywhere. Power generates corruption, generates power. We are witnessing this again with COVID. Now, she's kind of highlighted something here um, in terms of that difficulty in achieving ethical government. Um, and, and I think something that reminds us of that is perhaps Jeremy Corbyn, who Salma, you mentioned just now. Um, so the demonstration um, in all those years ago has kind of been pointed to as a crucial moment in what propelled Jeremy Corbyn to the leadership of the Labour Party. John, how much do you think that that was the case, that the kind of stop the war mobilisation um, played a part in, in the movement that put him to the top of the Labour Party? Obviously, it's been his, his last week there this week, but nonetheless, it was a powerful movement. Yeah, I think that's the um, I think that's the next instalment in the story that Amir was talking about and, and Salma has been talking about, about mm. the, the disillusionment which came after um the movement didn't stop the war i think i think that was a a, a thing um and i think for a, a a considerable period obviously people couldn't resolve there was no mass way of resolving that you know they they uh even if they hadn't left the labor party or or not voted for the labor party um they didn't expect anything um from doing so very 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 much um and and there came a point where um, the mass movements for change, and of course, uh, after um, the anti-war movement, we had a huge reaction to the to the crash in two thousand and eight, an anti-austerity, uh, an anti-austerity movement, a huge marches around the NHS and so forth. And then suddenly, I think actually to do with the Scottish referendum, first of all people began to turn back towards the idea that they did have to pay some attention at least to the electoral process and to parliamentary processes. And if you remember, there was a kind of, um, now largely forgotten, but there was a kind of, whereas political parties have been declining in membership for a very long time and turnouts in elections have been uh, going down with the Scottish referendum and then a, a, a sort of jump in membership of the SNP after that, there suddenly looked as if there was a return to interest in that. And I think then the same thing happened on a much, much bigger scale um, when that rule change in the Labour Party, suddenly people thought, hey, this is going to cost me a quid and I can vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and did so in absolutely huge, uh, huge numbers and sustained that movement in the face of uh, an absolutely incredible onslaught. And I always say um, this in meetings, you know, in, in my political lifetime, I've seen three people absolutely vilified by the press. One was Tony Benn, uh, the other was Arthur Scargill, and the third was Jeremy Corbyn. And to be absolutely honest, Jeremy Corbyn had it worse and longer yeah. than uh, either Scargill, which was basically the concentration was on him for a year during the miners' strike. Jeremy had this for, for four years. Um, and that was, and we shouldn't forget this, that was so much to do with his anti-war yes. uh, anti politics. You see, yeah. you know, as we see now, sometimes the capitalist system, it, it can live with a bit more nationalisation. It can live, mm -hmm. actually, is it living with a whole lot more state spending and state intervention at the moment. But what can't it live with? It can't live with a challenge to the national security state, to the whole business of, you know, uh, sitting at the top table in the in the UN of having a nuclear weapon um, of being able to militarily police the globe it really can't live with a challenge to that and and Jeremy you know uh, was the person uh, after Tony Benn who on the Labour left represented that and his chairmanship of Stop the War um, mm -hmm. was was, um, was uh, significant in in that so mm -hmm. I think that was a moment where the politics poured back into the electoral system, poured back into the Labour Party. And what I'd say about watching this process over this over this kind of 20 year period is, OK, I think that particular phase isn't going to isn't going to last Jeremy's uh, uh, defeat, but it's not the end of the story. 
just as it wasn't the end of the story um, when it started, it wasn't the end of the story after the Iraq war. There is a fundamental mismatch in modern society between what people need and what the system's capable of delivering economically, politically, um, globally, in terms of climate change, uh, now in terms of COVID-19. These are absolutely huge questions, e even bigger than the war question was, to be honest. And I don't think that the capacity of people to respond to that is by any means, uh, is by any means gone. And I think if you look at the Thursday night protests over the NHS, the, the clap thing, okay, you know, that's what you can do under conditions of lockdown. But hey, millions of people are doing it. It's actually bigger than the Iraq war uh, protest. Well, I mean, what, what do we think is participating in those? Maybe 10 million, 15 million, maybe 20 million people all doing that at the same time. Now, <laughs> it's a mass phenomena. And although the sun's running front pages and the BBC are advertising, I don't think anybody in this country is under any mistake whatsoever that this is about supporting their fellow workers. It's not about supporting the government. I mean, you know, I'm sorry Boris Johnson's ill, but, you know, the clap for Boris Johnson, that was a step too far last night. Mm -hmm. oh, it would have been a step too far if it had happened, but it <laughs> didn't happen. Um, and the Daily Express has taken to, to putting up videos of people clapping for the NHS and pretending they were clapping for Boris Johnson. Now, that divide mm -hmm. is probably wider now than at, any, than at any time I can remember. And the popular response to it is really quite remarkable already under conditions of lockdown. Yeah, I think the Jeremy Corbyn um, aspect is really important. Um, it, and again, about what the legacy of that march was, because people, it was a way that people knew that so many people had this stance. And while they were dismissed for many years, um, when it came down to Jeremy getting the leadership and the fact that the Labour Party became the biggest party in Europe, it was directly, in my opinion, to do the fact that he was associated with those principal positions, which many people could see that they just were not seeing reflected in, in, in the party uh, or, or other parties at that point. So it's certainly not over. They want it to be over, just like they wanted to be over with the war uh, when they went in and they, they want to say, look, that's it, you know, you guys are done. No, that the issues are still as relevant. And in fact, for me, I guess it's, it's a mark of what a threat and how close, because don't forget in 2000, in 17, Jeremy Corbyn was literally within 3,000 votes of becoming prime minister. I mean, people are, are making out as if Jeremy, you know, when I say Jeremy, I mean, I'm using that shorthand for that whole kind of political, um, you know, perspective, uh, as if, oh, you know what, that's done. No, that's that's not done. What, what they were very good at um, was mobilizing everything that they had in their armory. Don't forget, they are powerful. They have money, they have all of that, to try and demoralize our side, to div divide the left um, ar around their accusations um, of him on the one hand, as well as demonizing him in the most you know, characterized ways, so that people you know, ended up losing confidence in Labour and there was a misfortune of the whole Brexit thing. So I think you know, a combination of bad luck, um, you know, bigger political forces, but in terms of those stances, whether it's around NHS, whether it's around the economy more generally, each of these you know, policies are, are, are polling as you know, things that people want um, and around the um, anti-war agenda. You know, Jeremy was proven right and continues to be proven right. And, uh, and I think that's not going to change. And what we mustn't do is believe the rhetoric that's thrown at us, that these ideas have been defeated. Again, if anything, this COVID crisis has just, you know, very, very clearly demonstrated that we are a society, Boris Johnson, that you know, literally stood uh, on the steps of Ted Down Street to refute Margaret Thatcher's, you know, famous line, you know, to say, actually, we, we are a society. And I think what we must do is hold on and actually be proactive, not just about saying, well, look, they're getting this and that wrong, by saying this is what we should be doing now, this is what we can be doing, and this is what we demand. And I think people will come out, you know, as long as there is clear kind of, when I say leadership, I mean that as a shorthand for clarity, uh, just a way for people to come together, um, and just to stop the war provided that, I, I don't see any reason actually 
that we can't be kind of putting together those kinds of um, coalitions, those kinds of networks, because uh, this thing is international. Um, and any solution is going to have to be international at the end of the day, but you know, coming right back to the Labour Party right now, those members who voted for Jeremy haven't disappeared. Many of them lent their vote to Keir Starmer because he played a smart game by saying, I'm going to stick to uh, 2017 manifesto. He played it left. Um, you know, people, many, you know, people are skeptical. It's interesting what he's chosen to do within the first few days of the leadership. Um, but I think it, we are duty bound, those who are either members or even if they're not, um, to remain strong in the, not just on the kind of domestic um, agenda, but on the international agenda, because we know that there are um, very determined forces who, when it came to, for example, Operation Cast Lead, I think a lot of the kind of pushback from the um, Israeli government, certainly when they saw the huge numbers turning out on the streets to protest what was happening in Palestine at that time, that for them was a wake up call and they thought, well, democracy means that maybe we're having to be more accountable. And it's interesting that many of the groups that have been critical of Jeremy Corbyn were actually set up in the aftermath of the huge demonstrations of, you know, going, you know, that started after 2011, 12, 13, 14 as a direct reaction actually to, again, the, the, those mobilizations. So yes, we mobilize, but we must also kind of give ourselves credit that take ourselves seriously, that we do pose that kind of threat, which means that they will also hit back um, and then not, not kind of get demoralized or shaken by that. Take it as a backhanded compliment that you know people feel the need to actually go to these lengths because they fear that they, well, they know that their argument doesn't actually stand to real scrutiny, so then they have to resort to other means. And so that would be kind of my message to, to Labour Party members now as well, who may be feeling demoralised, that actually, no, you're not wrong. And those things that um, we're standing up for, you know, we, we need to be doing that. Can I just um, add briefly, um, you know, obviously a lot of people were demoralised. And I remember in 2015, when we had the film in, in, in cinemas, very often people would come up to me at the end of the screening and they'd say, you know, I'd sort of given up on the idea of protests because the narrative that they'd been given was you marched and it mm -hmm. failed. But then when they saw the film, not only did it energize them because they saw the scale of it and the story ref reflected back, back to them, but also the, the kind of legacies that the, that, um, that the film talks about. So it is, it's easy to get demoralized, but it's also equally important to remain, you know, energized. And we're not always going to have um, victories. And I remember it, it sort of happened a bit too late, but um, when Black Lives Matter movement started in America, uh, one of one or two of the founders of it, when they were asked, what was the thing that kind of inspired them? What was their first protest? And they talked about the Iraq war protests. Uh, and so, I think we have to look at these things as as going in waves. Um, and yes, it's 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 hard to always you know mobilize and stay mobilized, but it's also important to to you know remain uh, hopeful and and also to remember the message that you know that wonderful poem by Shelley, Mask of Anarchy, reminds us, you know, which is where I got the title of the film from, is that we are many, and if we do realize. The, the, the power that we have, we can, we can exercise that. And mm. I suppose there is a question that hangs maybe for another time um, for, for us and for the movement to think about um, is kind of what other ways of organizing, what other tools are available beyond protest. Protest is vital and always important. Um, and I wonder, I don't have the answer, but I wonder what else one can do. I mean, the Egyptians, you know, they stayed in Tahrir Square for 18 days and didn't didn't go anywhere. Um, we had, you know, Occupy and, and, and all sorts of other movements. And I, I just wonder, you know, uh, better informed people, bigger brains can talk about what what those things might be that we can do. But um, there's hope. There certainly is hope. And I think that that anecdote about Black Lives Matter is true of um, the, the thing that kind of radicalized me really was the UK student movement in 2010. You know, those of us that, that got involved um, mm -hmm. in the 
protests then against the trebling of tuition fees had as children gone on the demonstrations or at least been aware of the demonstrations against the war yeah. um, and kind of had that memory that that this kind of stuff is possible and it can make a difference. Um, Salma, you've really preempted some of the questions that um, came in already. I had one from Ian saying, um, how can those of us who are both Stop the War and Labour Party members organise in the post-Corbyn era? Can we prevent a full Blairite restoration and work to restore Jeremy's social movement politics, um, particularly in the, in the new period of sharp crisis? And we had a suggestion actually from Tony who says, Stop the War Labour Party members should organise meetings with Stop the War supported by their constituency Labour parties and I would like to add to that and say why not organise screenings of We Are Many uh, with yeah. Labour Party and Stop the War groups and um, Stop the War can help you get speakers for such an event um, and it's actually something that can be really easily done through a Zoom call um, in you know in these circumstances and we can support local Stop the War groups in organising online meetings so do get in touch if you'd like to do something like that locally. Also, Dave said, thank you all for a very interesting discussion. You're welcome, Dave. Since Blair was Labour leader, most anti-war activists found political homes outside of that party. But as Amir pointed out, that changed with the election of Corbyn. What about now? Where should people look to on the left for political representation, clarity and leadership? Selma, you answered a lot of that in, in what you were saying just now about where people should be. But are there any other practical things that people could be doing right now? Oh gosh, that's a big, big question. So I think people, with, if it's about within the Labour Party, um, yes, I anticipate a purge, and you know, it's interesting the kind of thing, the things that were prioritised, even when we're seeing the largest number of deaths in the country to the virus. Um, for me, it, it did strike me that Keir Starmer didn't criticise the government around that, but was instead focusing on placating um, cer certain groups who are even now calling for Jeremy Corby not just to be criticised but to be virtually criminalised. Um, so I think that there's a whole dynamic that's um, being kind of unleashed there. Um, I think the easiest thing for people to do is just to leave feeling demoralised but I think that's what certain, for, for, um, certain forces would want. Um, so I would say don't because actually I think the majority of the membership um, are anti-war. I think the majority of the membership um, see what's going on, but, um, and they, they again must have lose sight of their power in this, and certainly at a local level in their CLPs. Um, I think the idea of showing this film is really, really important. There's a practical thing right there, right down to our branch levels. You know, one thing you can do is, you know, set up, um, like, as, like we've just done here, um, a link, get people watching it together, and, and I trust that people come up with their own ideas. One of the really strong things about the anti-war movement was, we actually didn't have people telling us, you know what, this is what you guys need to do. It was people on the ground just deciding we're gonna to get together in our church, we're gonna to get together in our school. You know, it was really, really loose. It was just, it, here were the call outs on these days where people come together, but how are they organized? Um, you know, that, that for me was a whole tapestry and what gave it that real, strength because it was genuinely um, grassroots but having said that I think one of the things that I feel um, has contributed to what's gone on in the Labour Party in terms of some of the retreat that's we're, we're kind of seeing is that the left became divided you know when it came to the slates the left groups didn't agree so people have now been elected onto the NEC who again the majority haven't voted for and wouldn't necessarily feel represent them but because the left were not organised enough and that divisions happened. So I think some of this is about looking at our own kind of weaknesses um, and our own actions, as well as recognising the kind of the strength and the power of, you know, other forces. So I think that there has to be kind of a time of, you know, really thoughtful reflection about that, some kind of hard hitting truths, you know, some of it would be painful because it's about, you know, about mistakes on our own side. But going forwards, I think there, we still have a structure. The Labour Party is still the biggest party in Europe. So we must kind of think about where, what we need to do within that. But of course, politics is always bigger than just the kind of um, political parties. And the, the strength that the Labour Party at that time, the Labour movement got was because of the strength of the anti-war movement. And if you look at it the other way around, why was Jeremy so popular? 
because it was about the movements being reflected finally in the party. So I think as long as the movements stay strong, then whatever else happens in the parties, you know, there, there will be a place for that. So for that, it's, I think it's just number one, believing in your own power, believing in the value of your own contribution not allowing yourself or others to minimize that um, and then I think after, after taking ownership of that you know through our kind of local um, actions is being networked with other like-minded people you know we, we get strength from that we all do and like I said you know even on this call you know just we're reminding each other of these basic things um, and we've got the whole Bernie thing happening in America now the investment to see what happens there um, I think in some ways the left there have seen what happened to the UK and they may, I hope, have learned some of um, the, the lessons from that already. The signs I'm seeing are that they've been much more um, proactive in their pushback um, in, in terms of the, the stances they assert. Um, so that'd be an interesting thing. That would be a whole game changer if, uh, you know, Bernie or, or someone, you know, who stands for the things that he's standing for wins the American election. I mean, that would be an absolutely huge thing. And that's just a few months away. So who knows what the world's going to look like in another few months. But, you know, regardless of what else happened internationally, there's, there's us guys just doing our little thing in our own kind of localities uh, and knowing that so it was a long game. Nobody predicted Jeremy Corbyn would be leader. Nobody, you know, would have thought that would have happened. Nobody thought that we would have come that close to actually getting into government. And he's been the party decades. He didn't lose hope and I think the time will come again it could be very soon um, or, or even if it takes much longer but it's the right thing to do and I think we've all got to, a moral as well as political duty to be strong in that. Can I just say something here? Yeah uh, go for it. Uh, apart from the fact that Bernie Sanders quit the race today unfortunately. Yeah. Oh no sorry. Yeah, just before yeah. we came on the call somewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I what? You know, as someone who is, you know, ostensibly in the media, you know, um, I think in amongst all the other things that we have to discuss, we have to talk about the, the, the media and, of course, movements, social movements, anti-war movements um, never really get um, uh, proper, proper coverage. To this day, We Are Many has never been shown on British television not on the beat, you know, every single broadcaster uh, turned it down. Um, and you can speculate as, as, to, as to why. So maybe one of the things that people can do um, is, you know, outside of, as Salma was saying, outside of kind of electoral politics is to launch a very, very powerful, you know, people powered campaign to, um, you know, take money out of the, the, the media, some kind of legislation um, to, to democratize and yeah. pluralize the, the media. For, for, for me, that's one of the biggest, you know, problems. We saw that in Jeremy Corbyn's experience. We see that daily uh, in, in, you know, in, in other areas. And of course we, see, we saw it in the, you know, with the Iraq war. So that's, from my point of view, that's something that, you know, can be at least become a campaign that maybe people can take on and to put in the toolbox of all the other tools that we can, you know, marshal to try and uh, lead to the kind of society that, uh, uh, that we want. And by the way, I, I forgot to mention just something because of the Blair thing. I, you know, someone said earlier about uh, Tony Blair and whether we can bring him to to, to justice, um, you know, obviously there were attempts to do that. International law as it stands doesn't allow a uh, kind of a retrospective uh, prosecution for the crime of aggression, which this was. Um, and so, you know, there are people who are trying to, um, who are trying to sort of carry out citizens arrest of, of Tony Blair. I myself am developing a film about um, Tony Blair. Um, really? But yes, but, um, you know, uh, the reason I point that out is because, you know, when you have one of, you know, the, one of the perpetrators of the war walking free and actually appearing, you know, he was on the news yesterday, um, it does make you, you know, again, it's kind of um, demoralizing. What, you know, what can people do about that? I mean, 
who knows? Again, maybe one can campaign to bring about a change in the law in order to make uh, to 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 introduce some kind of justice and accountability um, into the system. Um, but I just wanted to sort of raise those two points about media uh, and 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 campaigning. Meg, yeah, we had a couple of questions um, to you around the media. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to those. Um, We've not got long left, so um, we're gonna have to have quite quick answers, but I just wanna read out something that Sally said. She said, I am a Labour voter and stop the war, but please remember that the two are not automatically synonymous. I know people of all political persuasions who are vehemently anti-war. Absolutely, Sally, stop the war is a coalition. We've got people involved in various political parties, but most aren't in any party. Um, and building a broad movement has to be about bringing people with different political views together behind a common aim and ours is of course organizing against war. Now Tony said it's difficult to mobilise when there is little concrete to mobilise for but we must stay connected by organising meetings and events such as these so yes really important and it's really great that you've tuned in. He also said the issue of Palestine and Gaza is something around which mobilisation is still a realistic possibility. I would say it's an absolute necessity and Stop the War has played an important role in mobilising against attacks on Gaza and for freedom for Palestine uh, for a number of years. Now, Amir, you said before um, about media coverage not being great for the governments of the time. Um, and I had a question here again from Stuart, who said, are the mainstream media completely compromised and not fit for purpose? Catherine also commented on rewrite, the rewriting of political news stories that we see happen in the press. And it's also related to a question that came in from Dave. How can we best fight back against the vilification by the press um, that John described? How can we break the power of the propaganda issued by the press barons and amplified by the BBC? And then Amir, I'm going to come to you with one more final question um, from Taggy, which says, can you talk about the practical and creative challenges of making the film, including the sheer volume of material and archive? And um, how did you choose what to use? And I'm interested as a student as well, where did you go to get much of that archive material? Um, okay, over to you, Amir, and then I'll come to Salma and John for some few closing comments as well. Okay, so on the first one, the question about, you know, are, it, are the media sort of compromised? Well, you know, lots of people have written about the composition of the media in the UK. Greg Philo and lots and lots of other people um, have written about that, which is something to do about the kind of the social strata in, 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 in the media. I've, I've worked in the BBC and out of the BBC and so on. That, that's not to say that there aren't anti-war voices, but they're in such a minority that it doesn't really make an impact. And there's also, it's hard to sort of describe, but there's a kind of a mindset, there's a kind of a group think, um, and you can't sort of break out of that. And it's hard to actually get into those organizations if in some way you don't sort of conform to those sorts of views. So, you know, I don't want to damn them all, uh, but the record, you know, you just have to sort of look at the record. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the people in the film, Patrick Tyler from the New York Times, he said there is this thing, you know, that he described it as the media industrial complex as a kind of analog to the military industrial complex. And, you know, it's a very appropriate kind of description. Um, I don't think we're going to really in my lifetime change that uh, so that there's a kind of a multiplicity of views in, in, in the media. I'm not talking just about the occasional comment piece that some organization, you know, puts out. I mean, famously, every single uh, of these sort of six, seven hundred newspapers in Mur Rupert Murdoch's empire, um, by some random coincidence, uh, supported the, the, the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. Practically every newspaper here did, the Observer did, and, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, so how, you know, how, how to, to fix that, I don't know, short of trying to sort of create some kind of um, major um, campaign, uh, which would be a huge task, but I think it's absolutely vital. It has to be, has to be done. And it, it's a much, much bigger topic of discussion than, than we've got time for, but that is my kind of basic view of it. The second question was um, the, the, the challenge of the, the, how to kind of corral all the, media and, and, and so on, so creative. Well, um, I, I, I tried to make the central thread of the film this day, both what led to it and what 
came from it and then build everything around that. I interviewed people who in one way or another had something to do with it, either organizing it, you know, uh, sort of opposing it or um, going on it. Um, and then of course, you know, sort of ha had to bring 110 interviews down uh, into, you know, down to 50 and then um, make it, you know, just under two hours and all the footage, I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of, uh, uh, of footage. It took, I think we were editing for about two years um, on and off, maybe, maybe, maybe a bit longer. Um, and we went from, you know, we had sort of eight, we began with a kind of eight hour assembly and brought it down over time until it came down to just you know, a, 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 an hour and um, 50. So it's, uh, it's a huge task and, uh, you know, was fascinating. And um, I don't know if there was another aspect to that question, but that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, because I know we're short of time, that was how, how we did it. Wow, a lot of hard work certainly paid off. Thank you so much, Amir, for joining us. And on that note, Salma, I want you to quickly, if you can, give me a sort of 30 second pitch on why those who are joining us this evening, if they haven't seen We Are Many yet, why they should see it. And if they have seen it, why they should get their friends to see it, maybe organize a screening of their own. Well, first of all, thank you to everybody who's um, linked in tonight. I'll be seeing all the messages, absolutely fantastic. I would urge each and every one of you, if you've watched it already, watch it again. If you haven't watched it, watch it. Make sure you've got your friends and family around you. You can do it in a social distance way. You can do it online. Um, and I can guarantee you that you will be uplifted. You'll be inspired. You'll be strengthened. And for that alone, you know, taking the time out, uh, you'll be well worth it. And what I would also ask you, if you can do this, is show it watch it whether it's by yourself or you manage to get a group to do it and following that link in with us in stop the war to say what you're going to do on the back of that i'd love to hear what um, individual actions uh, you know as individuals as families you know whatever groups uh, people are part of if they um, commit to doing one action you know whether it's just forwarding it on to somebody else or some other thing that people come up with you know because other people are far more creative than i am i'd love to hear about it so spread the inspiration and you know what you will be strengthened yourself so definitely watch it can i just say on that diana just asked an important question about uh can we watch it for free we can watch it free on prime for a certain a limited time is that right amir yeah uh well you can download to own for a few pounds on Prime, you can rent it on on Prime and on iTunes as well. Um, I, the money doesn't go to me; it goes to uh, Universal. But it does mean that you can own it, and you can, you know. Um, uh, and by the way, if there's anything I can do, if people want to contact me, they can either contact uh, Stop the War, who have all my details, or you can uh, reach me at info at wearemany.com. Uh, so, you know, if you want me to sort of join in one of these Zoom screenings and, and, and Q&As and so on, I'd be happy to do that. And, and also, I think it's a great idea from Salma to, to sort of, when you screen, to sort of say what you might, what, what you might do. I would love to put those stories on our website, which we're in the middle of revamping. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and finally, if anyone watching is, is interested in um, helping me with my uh, Tony Blair documentary, uh, we can discuss ways in which that can be helped. Um, get in touch again, either through Stop the War or to me at info at wearemany.com. And uh, I'd welcome I'd welcome that. But um, if you watch the film, um, uh, enjoy it and let me know what you think. Thanks, Amir. That's one action people can take. I can certainly think of one other, and that is joining Stop the War Coalition, which I'm a member of, Sam was a member of, we're, we're all members of. John, can you give us a 30 second picture of why everybody watching tonight should join Stop the War Coalition? Because social movements are, are the great political changers of our era. There's only one other body in society which is as important, and that's the trade union movement. Um, so I would say, if you aren't in a trade union, join it. It's the, the basic defense mechanism for uh, ordinary working people. And if you aren't in Stop the War, join it. We live in one of the oldest, uh, and in terms of its history, uh, bloodiest imperial powers. It's still the go-to chum 
for the greatest power on earth, the United States, when it wants to conduct war. We have a moral and political duty to attempt to stop it wrecking the lives of people in this country and the lives of millions of people around the globe once they're let loose. That's our, that's our duty. Um, no Iraqi and no Afghan can do as much as we can uh, to stop our war, our government waging war in their countries or any other country. And if you think that that's something that's worth doing, you should be in this organization. Um, ordinary people um, don't have much power. Uh, they don't have great wealth. They don't have guns. They don't have the ear of media. They don't have the ear of the powerful. They only really have two strengths. One is their numbers and the other is their organization. And to be perfectly honest, even the numbers aren't any good without the organization. Political power for working people is about numbers and about organization. And Stop the War has proved to be one of the enduring um, mobilizers of popular opinion, not just against war, but as Shelley was saying, in defense of the Palestinians. I'm involved at the moment with the backing of Stop the War in the trial of Julian Assange. Uh, there's only one other piece of film that's as powerful as Amir's film, and that's the collateral murder video which WikiLeaks uh, released of what the face of war really uh, looks like. So we're involved in civil liberties, in the battle against demonizing sections of the population on racial or religious grounds. We're uh, a, a force for democracy in this country. Uh, and if you care about any, or as you should, all of those things, you should be in the Stop the War Coalition. We need your time, we need your money, we need your ideas, we need your organization. Thanks, John. I've just posted links in the chat box there of how you can join Stop the War. It only has to be as little as two pound a month. And I've also posted a link for where you can watch the film. Thank you so much to all of you for joining tonight. It's been a fantastic discussion. I've really valued hearing from all of you. And I, I know those who've tuned in have as well. I've just seen that at least one person has said they're now going to join Stop the War. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evenings, comrades. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Lovely to see you all. Take care and stay well. Yes, you too. Stay safe. Bye Take all. Care. Take care. I'm looking forward to hearing all of those uh, suggestions. Yeah, let's speak. Maya, do you have any closing credits? No. Maybe. Ah, here we go. Stopthewar.org.uk. Get online. Join the anti-war movement. <laughs>